Hello, and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. I'm the host today, Kirsten Howe. Today's show is going to be fun. We're going to be talking about art. We all own art of some sort. Um, if you're like me, um, what you own is valuable only to you. My art is only valuable to me. Probably the frames are worth more than what's actually in the frame. But we have a lot of clients who own several or even many pieces of artwork that have actual monetary value. And in our business, it's important to know the value of our property, including our artwork for estate planning and estate administration purposes. And, and there are a variety of other reasons why it's really important to know the value of your artwork. But how is the value of art determined? That's sort of been a mystery to me. Um, I know we're probably all familiar with the concept of comparable sales in real estate. A real estate appraiser would go back and look at similar houses that have been sold in the neighborhood in the not too distant past and use that to come up with a value. But how do you come up with a value for something that is truly unique, such as a piece of art? And that's something that I've wanted to know. And so I have invited my guest, Claudia Hess, who is an art appraiser, um, to explain how she does it. And lucky for us, Claudia has recently written a book about NFT. So we're going to get her to talk a little bit about that whole mysterious topic. Um, but first, let me properly, properly introduce my guest. Claudia Worthington Hess with Hess Art Advisory is a member of AAA, which stands for Appraisers Association of America. And she also has an MBA and is a certified fine art appraiser and art consultant. She works with museums and clients across the United States, also in Canada, on insurance, donation, and estate appraisals. She's flu. I didn't know this. She's fluent in French and German and conversational in Spanish. So she's very well educated and has lived and studied abroad, both in Paris and Munich, and studied business and art also here in the U.S., um, she had her own gallery for five years and then started Hess Art Advisory in 2010. She's worked with many collectors on their new media art collections, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So when MFTs came along, uh, she was ready to go and conquer yet another aspect of the art world. Um, she, so she co-founded New Media Art Advisory in March 2021, and they have offices in San Francisco and New York City to address NFTs and how they operate in the art world. And she recently published a book on that particular topic called NFTs, A Handbook for Art Lovers. Claudia, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you very much for having me, Kirsten. Your podcast series is just so helpful to so many people on a great variety of topics. And um, I know no one jumps out of bed and says, I need to get my art appraised today. Uh, and it is kind of a baffling process. And it's science and connoisseurship mixed together with being an art detective <laughs> as well as psychologist for people's personal properties, but it's a, an exciting field. And yes, as you can see behind me, I, I collect conventional art and <laughs> conventional art too. So okay. we'll never become 100% digital, I don't think. I hope you're right. I, I truly <laughs> do hope you're right. Okay, well, let's, let's just start easy, baby steps. Um, talk to us about the different kinds of art that you might be called upon to appraise. And one set that I'm thinking of is, you know, fine art versus decorative art. Talk about the different kinds of art. Sure. Well, in the appraising world, we refer to fine art. Then we, call, we refer to something called the decorative arts, furniture, antique, silver, that kind of a thing. And then we also divided into what we might call multimedia art. That's art that might use screens, digital uh, files, computers, video. Uh, 
So those are three sort of schisms uh, that we might be dealing with. So yeah, that's, that's okay. in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I guess until you and I started talking, I didn't really appreciate that. Yeah, there's this whole other category, this digital art. Mm -hmm. um, we think of it's paintings on the wall, sculptures, um, teapots, <laughs> but then there's all this other stuff, the digital stuff. Um, so what, uh, what are the reasons that someone might need to hire an appraiser to appraise their artwork? Well, that's a great question. And it's usually spurred on by a life event. Oh, your insurance company wants you to have updated insurance values. Um, most people have an umbrella policy, but for jewelry and artwork, if it's over a certain amount, and certainly please talk to your insurance agent about that, it needs to get separately scheduled. And you can't just wave a receipt back from five years ago and say, yeah, this is the value. They, they need to have a snapshot in time of a current value. And that usually uh, stimulates an, an appraisal. And that's what we call the retail value, retail replacement value. Then we have things that go on into estate and donations, and that incurs another kind of value, fair market value. Uh, so someone has died. Hopefully, we want to really encourage people to ad address artworks or personal assets in their collection from cars to collectibles to art please think about these ahead of time. Um, it's much easier to make decisions not under duress. Sure. So in the planning, while everyone's alive and the people who are familiar with the artwork can say, oh, this is, this is something that has value. Maybe we should have it appraised much better than just walking into the situation after someone has died and trying to figure it out. Um, but I want to back you up just a bit. I don't want to nerd out too much on this, mm -hmm. but you, you, I think talked about sort of two different, maybe protocols or ways of appraising property, depending on the purpose. And when you were talking about the insurance company might need to know the value because they need to know what is that what their exposure is and they need to charge you enough money to take on that risk. That's a certain kind of appraisal. And what did, I can't remember what you called it. Uh, so the retail replacement value is the highest value because it's, it works on time. You need to replace that artwork right away. You can't be waiting for an auction to happen or to find someone who might be selling it. You no, know, you'd like to be made whole right away um but for the irs they would like to have something called fair market value and that means the price between a willing buyer and a willing seller with all facts known under no compunction to transact in other words you have time to do homework and research for the best price uh, a little bit like wholesale versus retail, but not always that way. Um, so those are two main value divisions. And yes, it's very much guided by why do you need this appraisal? Begin okay. with the end in mind. Got it. Okay. So in, in my world, when we're talking about, we're dealing with the IRS or we're valuing someone's estate, that's what we're focused on is the... Um, fair market value correct uh if it's if it's going to be needed for an, an irs filing if, right. if the estate just wants to know that might be a little bit different but in general okay. yeah okay all right so just to um sort of maybe start from that basic scenario that i tend to have to deal with and therefore my clients tend to have to deal with which is uh, somebody has died and um, now we've got to figure out what what this is worth because it has to be perhaps reported to the IRS, perhaps divided up equally among 
you know, multiple beneficiaries. So we need to know what it's worth. So you might be walking into, say, a house and it's full of artwork and things. And you've got to figure out what I think you preliminarily you have to figure out what is even worth focusing on in this house. How do you do that? <laughs> well, you made a very good, you painted a very good picture with real estate appraisers and personal property appraisers and real estate property appraisers follow something called USPAP, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. And yes, we are looking at the market to find comps. Um, either it's in the retail market itself, so I have to have a lot of connections to galleries and people and companies that sell art, or I have to subscribe to auction result databases and then finesse how do these sold works compare to what I'm looking at. And that's where science meets a lot of connoisseurship, a lot of experience in right. the world. Just... Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, so you have access to a lot of data, but mm -hmm. you, because you have so much experience, you know how to apply that data to what's sitting on your desk in front of you. Right. Most okay. often I'll have people say, yeah, I looked at the values and they're all over the place. And that's kind of where you need that experienced eye to discern what is a true outcome at an auction or not. Okay. So that to me is fascinating because um, when I think about what you might have in front of you that you've been asked to value, um, there are, I don't even know, I can't even guess, hundreds of thousands, millions of artists who've produced art in the history of the world and somehow you can distill it down to, oh, I think it's worth this much. <laughs> right. Uh, you have to be very fast learner. You have to have a nice thick Rolodex of other appraisers because just take for instance, uh, cars, rugs, Asian artwork, Judaica. I mean, you name it. There's so many areas of specialty, textiles. Like I have a textile behind me. If it's out of my purview and my expertise, I work with other professionals to bring you a credible appraisal report. Okay, so that's that's a really good point. Your your connections are a big important part of what you bring um, to a situation. It's uh, what's it's what's up here, and it's also uh, who you know. Because yeah. <laughs> you can't. I mean, logically, you can't you can't possibly know everything. You've got to rely on the people that you know who do know the things that you don't know. That's- Yeah. Uh, they always say, Claudia, you're always traveling. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of a bus man's holiday to New York. Uh, yes, I'm going to see art. Yes, it looks like it's exciting and fun, but it's really, you know, doing homework. The field changes so much. You have to know who's doing what at what gallery and, um, that's why I go and attend a lot of these events and network a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's you doing your <laughs> continuing education. <laughs> and we've got to have those continuing ed hours for our, our professional organization. Yeah. To maintain all the certifications yeah. that you've got. Okay. Um, so just briefly walk us through the things that you have to do and consider when you're appraising, for example, a painting? What what are the steps or things that you're looking at? Great question. Well, I'm gonna probably use, you know, what's behind me. Let's say I, I come across those paintings behind me. Uh, one of the first things I do is assess condition. In real estate, you know, you say location, location, location. In my world, condition, condition, condition. Uh, because condition can really drag down the value. And then I'm looking at it. Is this an oil on canvas, oil on board? Um, who is the artist? What are the artwork's measurements? I look on the front. 
I photograph the signature, I look on the back. Oftentimes the back of artworks can hold a lot of information. Now, am I gonna take a 30 by 30 foot painting off the wall? Probably not. But you know, within reason, we really try to grab all the information possible. And that's why we love to say our clients, come with your receipts, come with information, and we'll save you money if if we don't have to dig everything out ourselves. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So whatever they have. And also, I mean, I'm guessing that you get whatever information they know, but it's not on a piece of paper. Like you will be asking them questions. Where'd you where'd you where'd your mom buy this? How, how long has she owned it? What do you know about it? Yeah. And when, what I really like to caution people about stories. They're fun. They're wonderful. How many times have I heard, my grandmother told me this was valuable on her deathbed. Well, what is value? Value is what somebody will pay for it. And that, therein lies the, 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 the gist of what I do. We have yeah. to find out what is someone willing to pay for it. Yeah, that's the, the magic and the science and the... You, you, you want to buy, yeah, you wanna buy with your eyes, not only your ears, because anybody can tell you anything. Anybody can put something on a sheet of paper. You know, oh, I have a certificate. Anybody can make a certificate. So uh, try and do some homework and some due diligence. Yeah, it's about the actual market right now today. Yeah. What would somebody pay for that? Yeah. And that's where you your expertise comes in. Um well, I want to make maybe a tiny little digression. You and I have discussed this um, and observed it that people nowadays, younger people, um, <laughs> they don't really value stuff as much as people of a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, they, and we all do kind of, we tend to value nowadays experiences maybe more than stuff. Um, has that affected prices in the art world? That change in attitude generationally? It has and it hasn't. There are two things happening right now. The baby boomers' parents are aging out, passing away, and baby boomers themselves, you know, might also have had the benefit of collecting a lot of things themselves. Um, because because the younger generations aren't maybe tied so much to their own homes and they're very used to looking on a screen, we kind of have a little oversupply versus demand. But let's face it, you and I both know no matter what, for all those experiences, sometimes we really love an object. Humans are object oriented and we want to take something home from that experience, be it an artwork or little sculpture or whatever we still love our objects oh yeah that's why there are all those you know disneyland t-shirts and and yeah. <laughs> all of that stuff yeah i went to the happiest place on earth and i brought home a little statue of ariel or whatever yeah. it is yeah yeah, yeah exactly we yeah. like that it's it's in our our nature to kind of hold on to things okay well that's that's comforting to me <laughs> with my house full of furniture that i know my kids are just gonna throw in a dumpster um well, we, <laughs> let's go green let's use that nice fine solid wood furniture and uh stay away from all that particle board stuff if you can um i don't know i think gen z might be more open to looking at things a little bit differently they actually have something called grandma chic where <laughs> You're using grandma's uh, furniture in uh, a new way. So, yeah. All right. Well, so there's hope. Um, maybe my granddaughter will <laughs> someday know. appreciate my stuff. Okay. So now we're getting to the, the really the thing that I wanted to talk to you about. And that is NFTs. And you recently, let's first of all, you recently published a book. As I said, it's called A Handbook for Art Lovers. NFTs, A Handbook for Art Lovers. Um, first of all, where can we buy that? You can go to my website. I think they've got the banner Oops, down there. Thank you very much. Um, and one of the reasons I said for art lovers was NFTs have two main divisions that I've 
at least found. And that's for me working a long, long time in this, in this area. One is the collectible side, the tennis shoes, the uh, board ape yacht club generative art uh, kind of NFT. Then there are fine artists who are using NFTs as a tool to trade value on the blockchain. So what, again, what does NFT stand for? Non-fungible token. So is it the actual artwork itself? No. Just like you have maybe a token in a, an arcade, it's standing in for something. And in this case, it's standing in pointing to some information on a digital ledger system that they call the blockchain because they keep adding on blocks of information. It never goes backwards. It's always being added on. And cryptographically, it's secured. So um, it's a way of trading value digitally and putting information out there in a digital ledger system. And yeah, go ahead. Mm, okay. <laughs> it's okay. It took me about eight times to hear that information over and over again. <laughs> I know. And, and probably people really need to read your book and probably read it eight times and then maybe they'll get it. Cause to me, this is all very, uh, abstract. Yeah. yeah. And you say, well, gosh, Claudia, you're in the art world. Well, why'd you get into this cryptography and computer nerd world? Well, the, the big factor was that at Christie's, which is known to be an art auction house, sold one for $69 million. And the entire world went, what? What is an NFT anyway? And why what, on, would anybody spend that much money on it? And that's what I go through in my book. It, you know, what is the history leading up to that? And uh, before it was just, gamers and designers for games that wanted to trade their digital images and now all of a sudden we have an artwork worth 69 million and just to give you an idea of the volume of this market i just got some statistics this morning uh digital art transactions have ranged between a high of 78 million dollars Per month in April 2021, 78 million to an average of 24.7 million a month in October 2022. Now, yes, there's been fallout and you know the cream rises to the top, but it's it's happening and it's gonna keep happening, and people are still gonna be able to use this very versatile technology to trade airline miles. Let's say you're a member of American Airlines and you move to Atlanta, which is Delta's hub. Well, NFT technology might allow you to take ownership of those miles, which traditionally had been resting in the airline's hands, so to speak, and trade it. Say, hey, I'll give you my American miles for your Delta miles. So we're kind of taking back owner digital ownership of data that companies have had on us okay so back to the nft in mm -hmm. the art world i think what you're saying and it's very possible that i'm wrong so correct me is that there is digital artwork a piece of digital artwork exists and it's attached to a non-fungible token and thereby it can be bought, sold, traded in the using that blockchain. Yes. It's being used as a way to prove ownership because everything gets recorded. So um, a one way that it might benefit artists is future royalties. Before if an artist signed somebody with a gallery and they said, you know, hey, I want to be able to, if I make it big, 
I would like to participate in that upswing. And then maybe they had to like badger the gallery or, or maybe the clients didn't want to sign some kind of a, a contract where they would have to give these future royalties. This exists in Europe already. We're just very, very slow in the United States. So this NFT blockchain technology automates that. So if you're an artist and you've written a smart contract, you can stipulate that I will automatically receive some kind of loyalties in the future. It's safe. It's not fail safe, but it's a little bit better and more automatic for artists who really think they might make it big in the future. And it gives a sense of collectors to collectors. I have permanently recorded something on a digital ledger system here that says I bought this such and such artwork at such and such time for such and such money. Right. So it takes some of the the mystery out of what happened, what is the provenance of this thing, right? which is an important fact for somebody like you. Now it's all been documented. Right. And you remember when I back, I said, you know, anybody could write a certificate. This makes it a little bit more iron, ironclad, a little bit more permanent and, and not able to be altered because there are always people on these blockchain systems looking for anomalies, looking for bad information. Um, so it's, it's sort of self-policed. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are always going to be bad people out there trying to do bad things, mm -hmm. including in the crypto world. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is definitely, um, a a pretty secure way of authenticating things and, um, and tracking things backwards and knowing where they came from and are they legitimate. Um, that's, that, that is fascinating. Really, there is a huge ecosystem around this. They have databases dedicated to tracking the prices of cryptocurrency and um, the artworks themselves. There's a lot of new vocabulary associated with that, like the floor price and other terms you may never have heard of. But it's, you know, this infrastructure has sprung up around this and, and it's going. Okay. All right. So once again, um, you can buy Claudia's book, hessadvisory.com slash book. Did I get that right? Hessartadvisory.com slash book. Okay. Thank you for and that. Keeping in the the it, the world of digital, it is a digital download. Um, that way, I can update it. Um, I'm trying to work with uh, a designer now to actually turn my book into a 3D NFT. <laughs> so um, I, I, we're still in the, the early stages of that, but okay. yeah, it's a way so to automatically update. People. Oh, that, that's cool. Okay. So watch for that. But hessartadvisory.com slash book. That's where you can get it um, in its current form. Okay. So I'm going to um, turn to audience questions. Let's see. Um, okay. Is it more common for people to think their art is worth more than it is, or to be surprised that they actually own something worth money in your experience, obviously? I would say the first first case. Oh. Um, usually, you have a good idea if things have really gone up. Um, usually, you're not so cognizant if they've gone down or don't want to know. Okay, all right, that's fair enough. I would, I would have assumed the same as well. That <laughs> people think what they have is worth more than it really is. Okay, um, what? is the biggest surprise you have seen in your practice as an appraiser? Do you have an, an anecdote that sticks out in your mind? Um, great question. You know, usually you associate high price art with bustling metropolitan areas. And I did come across uh, uh, some people who did buy wisely in the beginning, whether they knew this art was going to just skyrocket it up, they probably didn't know.
but it was a very nice surprise to find in the suburbs of San Francisco people that bought artwork for you know the low thousands and then it rose up to about near a million dollars but you know that's more the outlier than than what most people have but sometimes you can really get lucky yeah okay so that that does happen sometimes <laughs> it, it does yeah and of course client privilege <laughs> client information i can't divulge anything but uh sometimes you do strike it lucky and there are art advisors out there that can help you uh, think about it if you'd like to just purely invest okay okay um I think there's one more question here. Are NFTs displayed for sale in galleries like paintings? In other words, if you want to go shopping for something like that, where do you shop for that? Oh, great idea. And gosh darn it. I think this my my uh, box is downstairs. So you can display NFTs. Um, there's uh, ways to put it on a screen. You can put it on your TV. You can put it on your phone. Okay. They have these really cool plexiglass frames that you can set up and, and watch your art. Uh, and things like that will get better and better and more high resolution. So you can maybe have a screen that scrolls through the various digital products you have. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. You can always, if you have it on your phone, you can bring it. You through. can put it on your phone. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's the last of the audience questions. Um, Claudia, thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to remind people if you want to, if you need to contact Claudia, again, hessartadvisory.com is a good way to start. Um, her phone number, 925-997-8133. Thank you so much for being here, Claudia. I, I learned a lot from you. Kirsten, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for being a service to all the people that watch your program because uh, these are great topics to know about. Okay, thanks so much. And thank you all for, for listening in, for watching us live, if you were able to do that. Um, I hope you got something out of it. I know I did. And I really look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our eBooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting absolutetrustcouncil.com slash scheduling. Don't forget to keep an eye out for our next live episode in two weeks. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon.